it's an honor for me to be invited to this year's CASCA meeting to give the Bills Award presentation. But first, I would like to thank the organizer for organizing this very first virtual meeting for CASCA in a very challenging time. Today, I'm going to talk about galaxy clusters and how they can be used in the study of galaxy evolution and cosmology. I will start with the outline for the talk. I will first give a short introduction on the usefulness of galaxy clusters in the study of our universe. Then I will spend a bit of time giving a summary of a number of large galaxy cluster surveys that I involved in in the last 25 years. And finally, in the third part, I will present some preliminary results from a new cluster project using CFXT Citel spectrograph to look at H alpha emission line galaxies in clusters. What are galaxy clusters? As we can see from the figures on the right, a poster from the Millennium Simulations, it shows that galaxy clusters are nodes of matter in the large scale structure of the universe. They are the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe with a size of typically one megaparsec. Their fundamental component is non-baryonic dark matter, a halo of the order of 10 to the 14 to several times 10 to the 15 solar masses. The baryonic component consists of two parts, the ICM gas and the galaxies. The ICM gas is about 12% of the total mass of a cluster. It is shock heated to about 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 Kelvin and emits strongly in the X-ray. There are typically hundreds to thousands of galaxies in galaxy clusters, but only 10% of the baryons are contained in stars and galaxies. So they represent about only 1% of the mass of a galaxy cluster. So galaxy cluster as a useful tool for studying the universe. I like to think of three primary use of cluster to study the universe. First one is cosmology. There are a number of cosmological parameters that can be derived from studying galaxy clusters. One that's used for quite a long time is to use the mass to light ratio galaxy cluster to estimate omega m, the uh, matter density in the universe. So this assumes that the mass to light ratio galaxy cluster is representative of the universe. And in that case, then omega m would simply equal to the ratio between the mass to light ratio cluster and the ratio of the closure density of the universe to the field luminosity density. The other main application of galaxy cluster to cosmology is the cluster mass function, which is the number density of clusters at different redshifts. This function traces the amplitude and growth of structure, and it provides an estimate of the sigma a and omega m parameters. So as demonstrated in this uh, simulation, in the growth of structure using a lambda CDM with omega m equal to 0.3 and a S CDM with omega m equal to one. And if you take the simulation and mark the peaks of the structure and call them galaxy clusters, and you can see that at redshift zero, you have a similar distribution galaxy cluster, but when you go back uh, in time, the omega m equal to 0.3 lambda CDM universe who actually have many more clusters compared to a more than m equal to one universe. Galaxy evolution. Galaxy cluster primarily provide an important connection to the interplay between galaxy evolution and the environment. Let's look at two 40-year-old seminal plots in exogalactic astronomy. On the left is the density morphology relation from Dressler. What he did was he took plates on uh, many Abel clusters, and then by eye classify the galaxy morphology, and then make a plot of the fraction of galaxy population of elliptical S0 spirals as a function of density. What you see is elliptical galaxy fraction increase 
very sharply as you go toward high density or cluster region. Whereas spirals, which is the dominant population in the field, drop to almost none by the time you get to the core of a cluster. On the right, it shows the butcher omler effect. When butcher omler in the 1980s measured the color of galaxies in clusters up to about redshift 0.5. And what they found is that as you go to higher redshift, the fraction of blue galaxy increases. This is actually the first observational evidence that galaxy actually evolve with time. The density morphology relation and the butcher omler effect still sets the agenda today of what we try to understand about galaxy evolution and environment. They are ultimately tied together on how the environment affect star formation history and galaxy evolution. Galaxy clusters provide the densest environment for galaxies. They allow us to trace what happened to infalling galaxies as they encounter increasingly denser environments. The key question is the quenching of star formation in galaxy in rich environments. This schematic of a color match diagram of galaxies show galaxies in the blue cloud in the field when their star formation stops, they turn red and move into the red sequence. Another interesting application of galaxy cluster is to use the strong gravitational lensing as nature's telescope. I'm not going to say very much about this in this talk. Here are pictures of three strong gravitational arts discovered from the RCS survey with high redshift galaxy behind the cluster lens into arts. The one on the left has a red art at redshift 4.88. The one in the middle has this very bright blue art at redshift 1.7. And the one on the right has a art at redshift 3.86. So now let's take a brief look at some of the galaxy cluster survey that I've been involved in in the last 25 years. So the first one I want to present is the CNOT one cluster redshift survey from the uh, mid 1990s. The goal of the survey was to measure the mass to light ratio of galaxy cluster to large cluster radii with a large sample of galaxy cluster to determine uh, omega m, the matter density parameter. At that time, other studies using the mass to light ratio cluster obtained typically omega m of 0.2 to 0.3. However, many astronomers and astrophysicists at that time believed that omega total should be one. So the question is, were we missing dark matter by measuring mass to light of cluster only over the course of the clusters? So this project used CFXT mass cis spectrograph. And for this project, we also use band limiting filters of about 1500 angstrom wide to shorten the spectra, which allow us to increase the number of slit from typically 30 to about 100. The sample of the project is 16 luminous EMSS, which are X-ray selected clusters, a redshift between 0.17 and 0.55, which at that time is medium high redshift. The project obtained 1,250 or so uh, cluster galaxy redshift. Here's an example of the data coverage of a Bell 2390, which is the cluster that we actually have most data. We did that with a mosaic of five mass fields covering 43 arc minute. And this gives a uh, extent of 9.5 megaparsec, which is quite large. We obtained 327 redshifts, of which 178 uh, cluster member. The graph on the, on the top of the two show all the galaxies in, in these five mass field brighter than 24th match. You can clearly see the cluster and its halo. And on the bottom is the uh, distribution of the galaxy that we actually have redshifts. This plot shows the 16 pi diagrams of the whole sample. Each pi diagram is running in redshift from left to right. And then the uh, y coordinate is the uh, one-dimensional spatial information on the position of the galaxy. So you can see that each cluster have this uh, concentration of galaxy at certain redshift. The main result from this is the uh, 
derivation of the mass light ratio of the cluster using primary velocity dispersion in dynamics of galaxies in the cluster come up with a mass light ratio of about 295, producing omega m of 0.24. So basically, uh, even when we go out to much larger radius, we produce essentially similar omega m as other study. This omega m is also consistent with the current day lambda CDM model. The project produced a large number of papers on galaxy evolution and galaxy cluster dynamics, which I don't have time to go into. And around that time, about uh, late 1990s, uh, we start realizing that both cluster cosmology and cluster galaxy evolution require a large redshift leverage if you want to do a good job. So there's a need to create large samples of galaxy cluster high redshift, basically around one or larger. Now, to give a perspective on this, in the 1990s, there are very few known clusters with redshift beyond 0.8. And even by the mid-2000s, perhaps a handful of clusters, mostly from X-ray survey, were known in redshift bigger than one. Around that time, uh, Mike Gladys, who was uh, working on his PhD at the University of Toronto with me, uh, and I developed it, uh, what we call the cluster rest sequence method, as a uh, relatively inexpensive and efficient method of finding galaxy clusters using optical data and to very high redshift around one. So here's an example of nine color match diagrams of galaxy clusters uh, showing that if you plot color versus magnitude with two filters that straddle the 4,000 angstrom break, you see this very clean sequence of uh, galaxies that are from very tight galaxies in a cluster. We use this um, effect to help us in identifying galaxy cluster. Here I show galaxy density in one CCD chip from the CF6D12K camera, the density of all the galaxy plotted as a grayscale. And now if I only plot the galaxy that have uh, color equivalent to elliptical galaxies at redshift point 0.9, what you see is a lot of structures pop up, including peaks. For example, the one in the middle, it turned out that there is, uh, in fact, two galaxy clusters there at redshift of 0.9 or so. So we carry out two RCS surveys. The one in the late 1990s is a 100 square degree survey using CFXT and CTIO. Uh, the cameras at that time is about a third of a square degree in field of view. A bit after the year 2000, Megacam and CFXT came online, and we extended the survey to a 1,000 square degree survey with a somewhat shorter integration time. In more recent optical and IR surveys, people are using more bands than simply two. The other uh, area we expand in searching for galaxy cluster is to use redder band in the IR to find high pressure bigger than one clusters. This lead to the SPART survey, which uh, Adam Wilson as a PI, who started this survey when he was a graduate student in Toronto. This survey used both optical and IR images. The IR images are from Spitzer with their publicly available SWIRE IRAP catalog. And we obtain deep ground-based Z-band data from CFXT and CTIO. So essentially this survey applied the same method as the RCS array, but the color it used is Z minus 3.6 micron rather than R minus Z. The survey is 42 square degree. We end up with about 200 uh, cluster candidate at Z bigger than one. With the SPART survey and the availability of these redshift one clusters, we started the G-class project, again, led by Adam Wilson. This is a follow-up of essentially the richest uh, spark cluster redshift around one, in which we selected nine cluster and redshift between 0.85 to 1.2. We obtained a total of 437 cluster member redshifts, and this is the largest sample of cluster galaxy and redshift one until the Go Green project. And we also have extensive multi-band ground-based photometry to go with the spectroscopic data. So here's the mosaic of the um, 
nine cluster from the main sample in the G class survey. We used the band knot and shuffle technique on GMOS to maximize the number of slip that we can cram into a small field where the very crowded field of the galaxy cluster is. So you can see here showing that one can squeeze in over 50 slits in an area as small as two arc minutes. He has stack spectra from G class for both cluster and the field. On the left hand side shows the, spec the stack spectra as a function of cluster centric radius from the cluster center in the bottom out to the field on top. And on the right hand side, we show the stack spectrum as a function of mass with massive galaxy at the bottom and low mass galaxy on top. As you can see, both in O2 emission line and H and K breaks, there's a significant difference uh, as you move from the center of the cluster to the field and from high mass galaxy to low mass galaxy. Here's a stack spectrum of post-star burst galaxy in G class from about 25 galaxies. Post-star burst galaxy basically have very strong monomer absorption line and weak O2 lines. Here we plot the position of these post-star burst galaxy, show as uh, green dots, on the velocity versus radius phase diagram of the clusters. As you can see, the post-star burst galaxy have quite a different distribution from both the quiescent and the star forming galaxy. On the right, we show a simulation which best fitting simulation is to have the star formation quenching occurring at about 0.5 R200 and with a time scale, the order of 0.1 to 0.5 giga years. The Go Green survey is a significant extension of the G class uh, survey that were done on spark clusters. Uh, the PI of Go Green is Michael Ballot. So Go Green is a Gemini large and long program. Uh, it is the largest LLP for Gemini at this point. It uses the same knot and shuffle technique as G class. And we also collect a significant amount of deep big band photometry from several telescopes. The main science goal here is to investigate the role of environment in the evolution of galaxy at Redshift 1, specifically down to the low mass regime of 10 to 9.5 solar masses. So the sample is 21 clustering groups, the redshift between 1 and 1.5. We select the sample based on that they are progenitors at redshift 1 to 1.5 of current day galaxy clusters and structures such as coma, Virgo, and groups, which are shown on the plot on the right. And the observation and data reduction are mostly done, and there's a public data release plan for later this summer. The total number of redshift in Go Green, including spectra, the same galaxies in G class is about 2300 with 620 cluster members. This is a um, interesting plot in which all the spectra from Go Green are stacked by redshift in this uh, 2D space. So imagine every single line that you can make out, horizontal line you can make out in the green is a spectrum and you put line them all up according to the redshift. So you form this interesting 2D mosaic of the spectra. So very clear, you can see O2, rest 3727 angstrom, uh, goes to a longer wavelength for higher and higher redshift galaxy. And you can clearly see all the Balmer lines when you put them all together like that, the H and K break. So some early Go Green results of galaxies from Go Green in the cluster, which is the uh, upper three, and in the field, which are the lower three, uh, as a function of stellar mass. A few papers have been published. Here I'm just showing two of them. Uh, one is from Lindsay Old, looking at the star formation main sequence in cluster galaxy, which are the red dots, and the uh, same thing for the field galaxy in blue dot, in this figure on the left. And on the right, it showed the exquisite uh, stellar mass function generated from uh, the photometric data with combination of spectroscopy data to improve uh, selection for cluster galaxy quiescent and star-forming galaxy 
on the left panel and the few galaxy on the right panel. For the remainder of the talk, I'm going to discuss the Citel Cluster H-Alpha survey. In the past decade or so, people have increasingly find uh, these so-called jellyfish galaxies shown on the left in nearby clusters, which have these H-Alpha ionized region being blown out of the galaxies, which presumably comes from RAM pressure stripping as the galaxy fall into a cluster. In, in body simulation recently, they're able to reproduce the similar kind of uh, tail in H1 gas in galaxies in clusters shown on the right. So a key step in understanding the physical processes involved in evolution of cluster galaxy would be to obtain spatially resolved spectroscopy. Citel, a imaging Fourier transform spectrograph, which can obtain uh, and spectrally resolve images. The IFU-like data is over a field of 11 arc minute, which is extremely large. The data you get are data cubes in X and Y on the sky and lambda in the third directions. So for every single point on your image, you can obtain a short spectrum. The field of Citel is what makes it really special. Here on this plot, I have viewed the largest field on 8 meter class telescope is MUSE from VLT with a field of one arc minute times one arc minute. And if Citel's 11 arc minute field is plotted on top of a Sloan images of Abel 2390. So you can see how Citel can image most part of a rich cluster. A major drawback of Citel is that uh, we have to use a relatively narrow band of observation at any one time, about a few hundred angstroms. So the Citel Cluster H Alpha project aims to uh, look at star formation in cluster galaxy down to about one solar mass per year uh, formation rate to get 2D information on H alpha morphology, kinematic, and luminosity. And a large field of view allows one to trace these properties of emission line galaxies out to as much as two virial radii. The filter we use is the C4 filter, a 250 angstrom wide filter with around 8,100 angstrom, allow us to obtain spectral images in H alpha and, and two for cluster redshift 0.21 to 0.26. And we have a proposed sample size of around five to seven clusters and maybe five galaxy group of lower mass. At the bottom, I show the collaborators for this project. They're mostly from Toronto, York, Laobao, and also from ASIAA. Currently, we have data cubes on three clusters. A Bell 2390, which we have three pointings. A Bell 2465, a double cluster, we have one pointing. IXJ 2029, we have one pointing, but we just got those data. We have generated a pipeline to identify emission line galaxies and using cross correlation method to obtain the rest ships. This is mostly the work carried out by Ching Liu a graduate student here at Toronto who worked on this project last year. Here are four examples of galaxy spectra and the cross correlation function. We use three correlation templates, an H alpha plus nitrogen two, an oxygen three, 49, 59, and 507, and a single line template. The top spectrum show a very good signal to noise H alpha and two emission line. The second spectrum show H alpha and N2, just barely detected. Third spectrum shows that you can also get interloper into your cluster if you're not careful with identifying emission line galaxies. This spectrum show a very nice oxygen 3, 507, 49, 59 doublet detected at redshift 0.64. Finally, the last spectrum show a single line which could have a number of possible redshift identification that can be resolved by colors. In this case, if it is a oxygen two line, it would be a redshift 1.17.
Here I'm showing a mosaic of the three Satelfi for a Bell 2390. Mark on it are green circles, which are objects with detected emission line. We found 88 emission line galaxies in the center field of a Bell 2390, 80 in the west field, and 72 in the east field. So for a total of 240 emission line galaxies. And the total integration time is the order of 11 hours. Here's the data for ABEL 2465, the center field. So as I mentioned, uh, 2465 is a double cluster. As you can see here, we detected 111 emission line galaxies, which is actually substantially more than the center field of ABEL 2390. This maybe is an enhancement uh, in star formation due to the merging cluster suggested by Wagner et al. So the first science analysis that we did is on the alignment of the ionized gas cloud with the cluster center. The idea here is that if ramp pressure stripping is a dominant mechanism affecting the gas and star formation rate of galaxies and cluster, what do we expect to see? As a galaxy come into the cluster, ramp pressure would push the gas in the galaxy back, which basically in the opposite direction of the velocity vector. In a study by Russell Smith and collaborators in 2010, looking at 13 cluster galaxies in coma, where they measured the centroid of the ionized gas in H alpha and the centroid of the stellar continuum, what they found is that there is a preference for the galaxy to be infalling in the direction towards the center of the cluster. So we create alignment measurements using the, uh, the data cube. So for each object, we take the spectrum and separate them into continuum channel and emission line channel marked in blue, red and blue. The emission line channel is only on H alpha. The image stamp at the bottom left shows the H alpha emission image and the center shows the continuum image and the two dot shows uh, the centroids for the uh, emission line and the continuum. They are approximately two pixels apart. The vector, offset vector from the emission line to the continuum is shown in the gray arrow in the center. Here are four more examples of these measurements. Here are histograms of the plot of uh, delta D, the distance between the centroids of H alpha and stellar continuum. You can see that about half of them have delta D that are greater than about one pixel. And if we look at the distribution of the difference angle between the offset vector and the direction to the center of the cluster, that's what they look like. Small angle is for objects have a velocity vector going towards the center of the cluster. In this figure, we plot the emission line galaxy in Abel 2390 on the sky. And here, the solid blue symbols represent cluster galaxies with their offset vector pointed toward the center of the cluster and the red symbol pointed away from the center of the cluster. We call that in the case of ramp pressure, the offset vector between ionized gas and the continuum should be aligned with the velocity vector of the infalling galaxy. We can try to interpret this offset vector on the galaxy cluster phase space diagram of velocity versus cluster centric radius. I divide the phase space into three regions. Region A and B is inside the realized region of R200, with region A being the infall and black splash region. And region B is where most galaxies would be realized. Region C outside of the rural radius of the cluster is the approach area and with some black splashing happening at lower speed. So let's look at what this looked like on a Bell 2390. Here, the blue dots represent velocity vectors going toward the center of the cluster and red dot velocity vectors going away from the center. If we look at the realized region and the approach region outside R200, the number of red and blue dots are about the same. However, in region A, in the first infall region, there appears to be 
more galaxy with a velocity vector pointing toward the center of the cluster than away at the 1.5 sigma level. We can look at the data from a Bell 2465. A Bell 2465 is a double cluster, and so the interpretation may be a bit uh, messy. However, if we look at only galaxies in the southwest cluster, what we find is that galaxies with a offset vector pointing toward the center of the cluster than away, whereas in the core realized region, the number the numbers are about the same. If we combine a Bell 2390 and a Bell 2465 Southwest, there's a significant amount of excess of galaxies with offset vectors or velocity vectors pointed toward the center of galaxy at the 2.5 to 3 sigma level. Let's look at the schematic phase diagram again. Here's a schematic of the orbit of an informed galaxy. In this approach, it comes through into the virilized region represented by the purple sphere, and then it goes around to pericenter, come around to the other side, to the black splash area, and then it go around a few more times and become virilized. What we find in the cluster data is that there's a large percentage of galaxy in region A, those galaxies that are coming in for the first time have their velocity vector pointed toward the center of the cluster. So how do we interpret these results? Interpreting these results are complicated because exactly what happened to an individual infrared galaxy would depend, would depend on the infrared orbits, the projection, the physical processes, and the quenching time scale, et cetera. And currently, we also have a very small sample of galaxies. The main observational result from this study so far is that in foreign galaxies with high velocities tend to have offset vectors, which if we assume REM pressure would be in the same direction as the velocity vectors pointed toward the center of the cluster. And these tend to be galaxies which are in the first infall and coming in with high velocity. There have been a number of recent simulations that find REM pressure in cluster increases greatly once you go past R200. And star formation can be quenched in the first passage of an infalling galaxy. So here are two examples of the study. On the left, two figures are the simulation from Lotz et al. Uh, on the left of the two figure, it showed the R over R200 of infalling galaxy with time. You see galaxies coming in and they reach perihelion and then they come back out again. And on the right plots the same galaxies, what happened to their star formation. And what their simulation shown with actually thousands of clusters is that there's a quick decrease in specific star formation rate once they enter the virial radius. And by the time they hit perihelion, which is around delta t minus one, gig a year, their star formation are mostly quenched. On the right is a figure of the simulation or stripping efficiency from Jeffrey et al. It shows the, where the reason in for galaxy would be and where the realized galaxy would be on the phase diagram. And the green dashed line show percentage of galaxy that would be stripped. So as you can see, where they initially fall in, many galaxies would be stripped. The H-alpha offset data that I've shown are consistent with strong RAM pressure for infrared galaxies that are coming in at high velocity during the first passage. The interpretation of the data is complicated. And as we build up more data for this project, the best way to move forward is to compare the data with the increasingly higher resolution cosmological simulation, where we can compare mock observation of 2D images of cluster galaxies in both continuum and ionized gas. To summarize my presentation, I hope you are convinced that galaxy clusters are a useful tool for studying the effect of environment on the evolution of galaxy, on cosmology, and gravitational lensing. I've shown that Citel is an efficient, 
very wide field IF U light instrument that is ideal for studying lower redshift galaxy clusters. In our first analysis of a small number of cluster, we see a clear pattern of alignment of ionized gas in the cluster center, which is likely due to ramp pressure stripping taking place in the first passage of the galaxy orbit. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the collaborators I have worked with in the past 25, 30 years. And I think a good number of them are in the audience, even though I cannot see them. You've been a wonderful bunch to work with. Thank you.